When, when we were worshipping, I was thinking of um, the story of Paul and Silas um, when they were in prison. And for all intents and purposes, they're actually doing the right thing. We all know the story. They, um, they're out preaching the gospel. Matter of fact, it, it comes on the back of, a, I think, a young girl that is delivered, that's being hassled by a demonic spirit. And they pray and she's delivered. And um, through a series of unfortunate events, these guys end up in prison. And, and it says, I think it's in Acts 16, 18, 16, somewhere there. It says that at midnight, they began to praise God. They began to sing hymns and stuff to God. Now, now, who enjoys worship this morning? Who enjoyed that? Who, who, yeah? It was great. It was awesome. I, I love gathering here with a bunch of people that think fairly similar to me. Fairly similar. I say fairly similar because if you could see what goes on inside this head at times, you would probably want to distance yourself from it. But, and you probably would from your neighbour, the guy sitting next to you as well. But the truth is that we're here because we, we love God. We're here because that historical event 2,000 years ago when Jesus Christ was crucified, buried and raised from the dead, we actually believe that. We have accepted the fact that we will never be good enough to stand before God in our own merits, and I don't care how good you are. If you compare yourself to the person to the left and the right, you might think that you're going to make it, but God's not going to compare you to the person to the left and the right. He'll compare you by his standards of holy perfection, and you're not good enough, and neither am I. And, and so I believe that Jesus' death upon that cross was him taking what I deserve so that I guess I could have what he deserved. And because he has paid the price for my sins, I can be reconnected to the creator of the universe. I can come back into relationship with God, not through my own efforts, not through my own works, but by that incredible act that Jesus did for me 2,000 years ago. But every now and then, things don't work out the way you think they will. Anyone know that? It just doesn't go according to the playbook. And we're probably not as guilty of it now as we used to be years ago. And I say we as in preachers, the church in the West in particular. There was this concept that was thrown out there to people that if you come to Jesus... I remember standing in a village in India when I was uh, working over there for some years working with an a, a, um, African pastor that had come across that was wanting to build a church. And so he came and grabbed a, a YWAM team that I was working with and we used to go out into the villages and we would preach and we would pray for the sick and we'd do all kinds of miracles and healings. It was amazing. But then he would get up on the end of us doing that and he would preach his version of the gospel to them. And his version was, if you want a job, come to Jesus, he'll give you a job. Now, if you're a poor village person in India that... Has a, loves their family as they do and wants to feed their family and so on and you're told that Jesus will definitely 100% give you a job, come to him then you're going to come to him if you want money, and this is what he would say if you are poor and want money, come to Jesus he'll give you money now if, if you're poor, a, a village person in India and you don't have money and somebody says you, to you this God, I guarantee 100% he'll give you money of course you're going to come to him and you know what, we had a similar message kind of being preached for a long time in the West too, that, that if you weren't healed, it was your lack of faith. So come to Jesus, you'll be healed. Come to Jesus, you'll have everything you want. He'll give you everything and everything will be rosy. No, not much mention about the work and the effort that'll be on your part once you do that, that we're still human and we've still got to push through and we've still got to believe God and we've still got to stand strong and stand firm. But it was just come to Jesus, he'll give you all this stuff. There's a trail of broken people who bought that. Uh, anyone seen the movie City Slickers? Yeah, I love that movie, Billy Crystal. And there's that scene where he's, he's helping a cow deliver the... Remember that little cow, Norman, that ends up being his buddy? And when Norman's being delivered, he's standing there and he's part of the process of delivering that horse, only he didn't have the veterinarian gloves and gear on, so it wasn't a nice scene. And he turns to Curly, the leather-skinned guy, and he looks at him, he goes, this was not in the brochure. This was not in the brochure. And unfortunately, for a lot of people, the brochure when they came to faith years ago used to read that come to Jesus and bottom line, everything will be sweet and easy. 
How many of you in this room have a different story to that? To come to Jesus, your marriage will be perfect. When Delma and Theo came together as believers, you should see they've never had a, a moment of, of difficulty. I can't walk you up there. Their marriage is just perfect, never had a problem, never had a, a difficulty. Delma, he's been the perfect man without a doubt because he's a Christian, so he must be vice versa. Any parents here? Watsons, the weeks as you had children, it's been absolutely perfect. There's been no problems. It's been a bed of roses. I know your children are looking, you can't, amen. <laughs> they do love you. Children, they love you. Well, here's Paul and Silas, and man, they're doing the stuff. They're out there, they're preaching, and they're planting churches, and praying for the sick, and, and cast out this, this, this demon from this girl who's set free. But um, uh, some people weren't happy about that, so they end up in prison, and it says that at midnight... At midnight, while they're in this prison, they began to sing hymns to God. I, I, lo I, love, I love that for several reasons. Number one, most of us, when we're in a midnight position in life, uh, being the darkest, quietest, there's no noise, you're not hearing from God. Uh, not only were there, was it midnight, but they're in prison, so they're restricted, they can't go anywhere. Not only in prison, they're bound, they're shackled. It's not a good place. But in that place, they found the capacity to praise God to worship God in the midst of that. What, what incredible faith. There was something about their faith that in that moment, rather than pull back from God, like a lot of people do in difficulty, we pull away from God. Um, rather than be honest with God or people, we just go, ah, oh, it's all good, I'm sweet, praise the Lord. It's, uh, meanwhile, you're tearing yourself apart. They were able to praise God in the darkest moment. You know, when you, when you believe that come to Jesus and he'll give you everything you want and one day you wake up in a prison at midnight bound up, something's not adding up. One of them is not true. Maybe God doesn't love me. Maybe, God, maybe that's a sign that God doesn't love me. A lot of people feel like that. Something difficult happens or hard happens and, and we, we, we take that as a sign that, that well, God mustn't be with me anymore. God's not for me. God doesn't love me. Maybe God's abandoned me. Why? Well, because it's difficult. It's tough. It shouldn't be this hard. Paul had great faith. Yeah, he ends up in a prison here with Silas. Paul had great faith. He ended up according to church history, getting beheaded with great faith. Doesn't sound like a good outcome. <laughs> John ends up in exile on the Isle of Patmos and writes the book of Revelation. He is a man of great faith. Doesn't sound like a great outcome being shoved on an island somewhere. Peter, church history says, was crucified. He wanted to be crucified upside down because he didn't feel like it was worthy to be crucified right side up like Jesus. He was a man of faith. It didn't sound like a great outcome from a man of faith. There are men and women right throughout history who have had great faith, but not great outcome. But somehow, they've stayed in a place of faith. They've stayed there. They've stayed there. I, I want to read something uh, uh, to you from uh, First Peter. Where are we? First Peter. I think it's chapter one. Let me find it and make sure I'm not leading up the garden path. Chapter 1, verse 8 says this. It says, Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you've not seen him, speaking of, of Jesus, though you have not seen him, you love him. And watch this. And even though you don't see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. What do you do when God's wearing camouflage gear? What do you do when God's dressed in camo? You can't see him. You can't see him. Peter's saying here to this, the, 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 these people that even though you can't see him, even though you can't see him, even though you've never seen him, and right now you can't see him, there's something about your faith that still fills you with an inexpressible joy. Even though you can't see him. 
even though there's no visible evidence of his presence. Even though it's difficult and it's tough. Even though the prayers that you're praying aren't being answered yet. Even though the healing that you're believing for hasn't come to your body yet. Even though the freedom that you're crying out for hasn't happened yet. It's not that it's not going to happen. I don't know whether it's going to happen. But the point is it hasn't happened yet. And that's why you feel like you're in a prison. That's why you feel like it's midnight. That's why you're bound up with chains. That's why you, you, you feel like I can't see him right now. I don't know. But, but, but the truth is we know he's there, right? I mean, that's, that's faith. That's what faith is. It's, it's, sometimes I think we want a Christian experience where everything unfolds in front of us so visibly that we actually don't need faith anymore. We don't need faith. We want things to happen and unfold so that our faith goes to a point where we actually don't need faith anymore because it's just so plain and obvious. Yet we look through a stained glass window, so to speak, at the world around us and the situations we're in and we don't know the full story, but we need to trust that even though I can't see him, God is there. He's just, for whatever reason, he's wearing some camouflage gear at the moment. But he's there. God's there. In the darkest times, God's there. In those moments where you feel like he's not, God's there. You know, I had an experience many, many years ago. I would have been 20, 21, something like that. I got saved at 19. 19 years of age, I came to faith. I came to the, the belief in the Jesus story and what it was all about. And I, I gave my life over to him at 19. 20, 21, I think it was, I ended up in India. And I'm over there and I'm, I'm doing a, a missions work in, in central India. But before that, I went and did a training school with an organization called Youth with a Mission. The school was called a school of evangelism, six-month intensive evangelism training. We had speakers flying in from all over the world. There was no COVID back then, so you could travel. And during that period of my life, we had a three-month lecture phase. And during that lecture phase, let me tell you something. Anyone ever read the story of King Midas? Anyone remember that story about King Midas? Everything the king touched turned to gold. Everything he touched turned to gold. And during that three-month lecture phase, here's, here's what happened literally for me personally in my faith journey. I'm new, to, I'm new to faith. I've only been walking with the Lord for a few years. But I felt that this is what God had for my life. So I'm heading over to India. I'm getting trained up. During that three months, here's what happened. I saw the most amazing miracle and signs and wonders and things that I'd have read about in this book but never actually seen with my own eyes. I got a chance, for whatever reason, for three months to just see them happening in a setting just like this. Just like this. People were being delivered of, of demonic oppression and demonic spirits right in front of my eyes. I'm watching this stuff happen going, hang on, I've read about that stuff in this book here. And all of a sudden, here it is happening. The year was 1993, I think it was, 94. And there it is happening in a tent. We weren't even in a building, we were in a tent. In, 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 down Redland Bay Road, Carbrook in Brisbane, on a property with a tent, and God's doing miracles. People are being physically healed. I'm watching people with sicknesses and all types of things getting healed. Word got out. Some of the churches in Brisbane began to come to our lectures during the day because of what was happening. The Holy Spirit just decided to let Himself loose and just do all the stuff that He does. It was amazing. And then at the end of that period, it was time for us to go overseas on a trip. So we would jump on a plane and flew over to India. By the time I got on that plane, here's what was happening on the Youth of the Mission base in Brisbane. Anyone that had any needs, everybody would say, go and ask Alan to pray for you because when he prays, it always happens. And it did. It did. Anybody, I didn't care. The, 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 the base leaders, the, the directors, they were coming to me saying, we've got this need, can you pray? Well, we don't know why, but every time you pray, all you've got to do is think something to God and he does it for you. And that's what it felt like. God just did, it was so easy. Put it this way, it wasn't midnight. I was standing on the crest of a mountain in the midday sun, enjoying life. Does it get any better than this? This is Jesus. Awesome. I'm saying, what a great choice I made to follow after him. Look where it's got me. We went over to India. 
And while we're over there, we're, we're preaching and we're going out to villages and we're working with local pastors and so on. And it just kept on going. We just kept on seeing miracles and signs and wonders and healings and, and, and deaf people hearing and people that hadn't walked for two years jump up off mats. It's happening right there in front of my very eyes. One night, me and my best friend, he was an American guy, his name was Justin. And one night, me and Justin, we were living together in this little sort of unit type thing in, in central India in a place called Nagpur. One morning, uh, me and Justin got up, we made our coffee as we do, and we're chatting, and we posed this question to each other, because we were both pretty young. I was 20, 21, Justin was about a year younger than me. And we said, you know what? I want, what if our character is not such that this kind of stuff could really give us a big head? And we could really get full of ourselves and think we're something special because it's just unbelievable what God is doing through us. And we chatted about this and in the end we decided to get on our knees and we did this in, our, in a little, little balcony there. Uh, uh, sorry, went back inside, we were in the room, got on our knees, knelt down, both of us at a bed and we prayed a prayer and we said, Lord, if our character is not there, if you can see down the track that we're going to be filled with arrogance and pride and so on, then you know what, we, I would rather that this stopped. Was it a good prayer or a bad prayer? I don't know. It was just a prayer that we prayed. We got up. We cleaned ourselves. We were meeting a pastor that day. We went out to a village and we began to pray for people. We preached. Everybody came up. We were praying, just knowing what was going to happen because this had been our story for the last few months. And I remember a little lady, she came like this, bent over, couldn't stand up straight, walked up to us. We laid hands and we prayed for her. She said, can you stand up? She said, no. We said, we'll pray again. Because, you know, Jesus prayed a couple of times. One time he prayed and said, can you see? No, I see men like trees walking. I'll pray again. So we'll do it again. We'll pray again. So we prayed again and said, you know, can you stand up? She said, no. So we did the next best thing. I'll oh, just go away in faith and believe. God, God's going to heal you. He, you know, we prayed in faith. We know he will. You just go away. Never caught up with her to see whether he did or he didn't. I don't know. But the point is, as the day went on, one after the other after the other, all of a sudden we were not getting the results that we thought we were going to get. It wasn't that we didn't have faith. We just weren't, it wasn't playing out the way that we thought it would. That began a really dark period for me. Cut a long story short, I was up for a visa extension in about three, four months after that. And so I jumped on a bus and I went up through central India and I had to go to Nepal to renew my visa to get back into the country. That's the way it worked back then. And I got up to Nepal and instead of renewing my visa, I separated myself from the other couple of people I was traveling with, went to the airport, bought a ticket to come back home to Australia. On the way home, I stopped at Bangkok airport and I went to the music store and I bought all this music. Cassettes, remember cassettes? Anyone remember what a cassette is? I used to put it in a machine, had two reels on it with tape. Your parents can explain it to you later. You know what I did? I walked into the music store and I decided to grab all this music and I went for all, this, all the music that I thought God would hate. I wanted music that I thought God would hate because I actually wanted God to hate me because I had allowed something to fester in my heart to the point where I decided I hated God. I hated him. I used to have these little kids in, in uh, India that, that were slum kids. They used to... I'd go into town on my bike and they would come on in on, uh, uh, when I was on, uh, going to do some shopping. They'd come to my motorbike and they would get a rag and they would polish my bike. They would clean it. And they were like guard dogs. Like they would guard my bike from anybody, my motorbike. I'd go do my shopping, come back. And what I used to do is I started out by, by um, you know, giving them some, some money. They were bigger kids. But then I found out they'd just take it home, give it to dad. Dad would drink it, send them back out. So I changed my tactic and I thought I'd buy them shoes. So I started buying them shoes. And then I noticed the next day the shoes were gone and one of the shopkeepers would say, don't do it because they go home, dad takes the shoes, sells them, goes and drinks himself stupid with the money. So what I started to do was I used to go, you guys watch my bike. And at the end of it, when I would come back, I'd take them across the road to a little ice cream store and I would buy them all on ice cream. And I would sit on the stairs with these little kids and they would gibber to me and I wouldn't understand a word of it and they would think that was hilarious and I'd talk to them and they didn't get it and I'd think that was hilarious. And we would, and for a brief moment, I'd watch these kids actually be kids. They weren't beggars, they, weren't, they were just kids. And we would eat our ice cream and we would have fun and laugh together. It was beautiful. But what happened was when God stopped answering these prayers exactly how I thought he should, 
I remember sitting there one day with the kids and looking at them while they were eating their ice cream and going, hang on a second, God, this isn't fair. I, don't, I, I bet you not one of these kids asked to be born to an alcoholic father in a third world country. I bet they didn't ask for this, God. Now, hang on, God. If they didn't ask for it, but you're the creator and you put them here, then you, put, you, chose, you chose these little kids to be born to an alcoholic father in a poor country. You did. Maybe you're not as good as I think you are. And this thought rolled around and round and round until it ended up with me on a plane in a music store at Bangkok Airport going, I want God to hate me as much as I hate him because I don't think God is good. I think God is cruel. God is mean and I don't want nothing to do with him. I didn't even tell anybody what I was doing. I just wanted to separate myself from God, from church, from everything. I just had a gut full because God wasn't who I thought he was. I came home. I landed back in... Uh, Brisbane Airport, I ended up coming down to, back down to Ballina, which is where I lived when I became a Christian. And what I did is I spent about two weeks just walking up and down a laneway just behind River Street there, the little laneway that runs up and down parallel to River Street in Ballina, with my headphones on and all this music, just screaming out all this stuff that I knew God would not be happy about. I must have looked like a loony, like a crazy man, because I was walking down the laneway by myself with the headphones on and I would stop. And I would stop because I knew where God was. I can't explain to you to this day how I know that. God was to the left of me, about two steps behind me. I just had this unbelievable knowledge of exactly where God was at that moment and he wouldn't leave me alone. He just wouldn't leave me alone. And I would walk and it would get me mad because it's like, God, can't you see? I don't want nothing to do with you anymore. I'm finished with you. You're not good. You're not great. You're not awesome. And I don't want you in my life. And he would stay about two. I can't explain how I knew. He was two steps behind me off my left shoulder. And when I would stop, here's what God would do. I, and again, don't ask me to explain how I know. I just knew in my spirit, this is what he would do. He would stop and fold his arms and stand there. And it would make me angry. And I was raising my voice to Casper the friendly ghost behind me. Leave me alone. This went on for two weeks. Finally, a friend of mine in Brisbane found out what had happened because I didn't tell anybody. And he tracked me down and said, can I come on down to Ballina and just talk to you? And I said, it's a free country, dude. Do whatever you want. So he dropped his kids at school. He drove all the way from Brisbane down here to Ballina back before we had this nice highway. And we met and we sat by the river and he tried to talk to me and I wasn't that interested. Then all of a sudden in a moment, I broke. And I started weeping and sobbing. And I started saying to this guy, I don't get it. I just don't get it. These kids, they didn't ask for this guy. They didn't ask to be born there. They didn't ask. There's, there's, there's a lot of things in life that are cruel, that are wrong, that don't make sense. How can God be good? How can I have faith in a God who let that happen? And he just sat there and listened to me. And when I was finished unloading, he said to me, can I pray for you? And I said, it's a free country, mate. You can do whatever you want. So he prayed for me. Then he got up and left. He said, I've got to go back to Brisbane now, pick my kids up from school. So he took off back up to Brisbane. I sat there on that jetty for a while by myself. As I sat there, the Holy Spirit spoke to me, probably one of the clearest I've heard my whole life. Psalm 103, verse 7, it says this. It says, He made known His ways to Moses, His deeds to the people of Israel. He made known His ways to Moses, His deeds to the people of Israel. And then the Holy Spirit began to say this to me. He said, Alan, you've got two options. You can either put your faith in what I do, Israel did that and it didn't work out too good. Every time God did what Israel wanted, they were high five and they were loving, loving him. It was awesome. Whenever God didn't do what they thought he should do, what did they do? Grumbled, they complained, turned their back. God said, you can build your faith on what I do. But here's the thing, what I do is going to change. Why did that person get healed of cancer and not that person? I don't have an answer. I don't know. I don't know. 
Why, why did God meet that financial need over here, but it looks like this one here is still there? I, I, I don't know. I, I don't have the answers. I don't have the answers. Why did that marriage make it and that one didn't? I, I, I don't know. And if your faith is in the deeds that God does, if your faith is built around the actions of God, God's actions will change. Sometimes you'll like them, sometimes you won't. And God said you can either put your faith in the actions of God that will change, or you can put your faith in the character of God that will never change. You can build your Christianity on the experiences you have and the actions. Well, here's the thing. God's actions will change, but God's character will never change. Why did God heal that person? Well, because God is good and faithful and just and righteous. That's who he is. Well, why didn't he heal that person? I don't know, but he's still faithful and just and righteous and good. And when God's wearing plain clothes right in front of me, I have faith and I can rejoice. But when he's wearing camouflage... I can still rejoice because God is the same. He doesn't change. See, through my training on my evangelism school, here's what ended up happening was I, I built my faith on the activities of God, what God did. And all of a sudden, God started doing something different and I got angry at him. He wasn't the problem. The foundation of my faith was the The foundation of our faith has to be in the character and the nature of God, that God is good. And right now, this, by the way, that's not my message. This is my message here. I'm not going to preach it now. It's, it's really good. You have to come back another time. But while we're sitting there in worship and we sung that, 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 that song, um, whatever I walked through, that one, Valley of a Sense, is that the one? We're singing that song and I just felt the Holy Spirit say to me, there's some people here today and you're struggling. You're struggling with your faith. You're struggling with an issue. And it comes back to... To, to the issue of character. Can, can you, in the midst of the prison you're in, can you, in the midst of the moment you're going through right now, can you, can you turn and fall back on the character of God? It doesn't mean the situation is not hard. It doesn't mean it doesn't hurt. It doesn't mean it's not difficult. It doesn't mean the battle's not real. But what it means is in the midst of it, you know that God is still good. You know that God is still gracious. You know that God is still faithful. You know God is still trustworthy. You know he's still loving. You know that. Because if you don't know that, you end up like Israel, up and down, up and down, up and down. It's like that flower. He loves me, loves me not. He loves me, loves me not. Loves me, loves me not. Let's hope the last petal says he loves me. I'd hate to get to the end of the last petal was he loves me not and I've got nowhere to go. Is the foundation of your faith in what God is doing for you or not doing for you? Or is it in his character and his nature? I want to do something a little bit different this morning. We don't always do this. And, and, and this is not a normal... Um, what is normal anyway? We have so many abnormal Sundays. I don't even know what a normal one looks like anymore. <laughs> Got some announcements there, but I'll, I'll put them up the back when you talk about them. Hey, I want to do something this morning. I want to pray for some people. And, and, and here's how we do it here. Uh, we've got a leadership team here, and, and I'm going to ask, ask you, if you feel like the Holy Spirit's speaking to you this morning, I want you to come forward just as an act of faith, even, even just a simple act of getting out of your chair and walking forward in response to something the Holy Spirit's saying is a step of faith. Whether the answer drops out of the sky in the moment or not, you won because you responded to God. Maybe you're here this morning and you don't want to do that. You feel uncomfortable. Hey, that's fine. You know what? The chairs to the left and right of you are filled with great people who have the same Holy Spirit in them, who love the same Jesus I do, as you do, as our leadership team do. And, and, and maybe you might want to turn to somebody near you and say, hey, would you pray for me? Here's what I'm going through at the moment. Here's, here's what I'm facing. Here's the challenge that I have at the moment. The early church was birthed by a group of people who had faith in the character and nature of God. We know it wasn't what God was doing because listen to some of their stories, the stuff they went through. 
They were able to face these things, but at no point did they turn away and say, well, God, you're not worth it anymore. God, you're not good. That thing there is evidence of the fact that you don't really love me. They didn't have a faith that went like this. They had a faith, no matter what they were facing, they knew God was good. They knew that he loved them. They knew he was for them and not against them. They knew that he was on their side. They knew that even if he was wearing camouflage gear, he was there because he said he'd never leave them nor forsake them. Is that the faith that we have in God today? Is that the faith we have? Is that the faith you have? I'm going to pray for us and then I'm just going to ask these guys to, if you could sing that song again for us. And while that song's on, if you want to come forward, we would love to pray for you. If you don't want to, that's completely fine. You might want to turn to somebody, ask somebody to pray for you. Um, officially, I guess the service, so to speak, will be over. Feel free to head on out the back there. There's tea and coffee in the room next door. Grab some tea, grab some coffee. Just respect the space here. If people are doing business with God or, or praying, whatever, just, just respect what's going on there. But Father, I want to thank you for uh, this morning, God. I want to thank you for who you are. Father, I want to thank you, uh, God, that you are unchanging. God, the world around us is changing. What society says the church can or can't do is changing. What society says they think of the church is changing. What Christians feel like they can and can't say is changing. But God, you are unchanging. You are the same yesterday, today and forever. God, the care and compassion that you had for these people we read about in these ancient documents, that's the same care and compassion you have for us. You haven't changed. God, your love for us is as real today as it was the day we bowed our knee when we felt like the birds were singing for us or we felt like the sky was painted blue just for us. God, you love us as much today as you did then. You're for us as much today as you were then. God, that moment where we came to you, God, that moment where you healed us, where you set us free, God, that moment where you did that thing that we cried out from the bottom of our heart for you to do and you did it. Lord, you're the same God today. Even if you're not doing the same thing, you're the same God. And Father, I want to pray for each person in this room, Lord, that is struggling in their faith this morning, God. Lord, maybe just going through the motions because it's what you do. You come to church, you sing songs, you put your hand in the air, you, you, you do your stuff. But God, deep down inside, their, their, their faith, the core of their faith, the foundation of their faith, they're struggling, Lord. They're asking the question. They're struggling to believe that you're good right now. They're struggling to believe that you're for them right now. They're struggling to believe that you're even standing in the same room as them right now, God. And I pray for those people. And I just pray, Holy Spirit, would you open their eyes and let them see that you've never left them, God. Open their eyes and let them see that you are the same. You're the same today as you were back then. Lord, I want the testimony that Peter writes about, that even though I don't see him, even though I haven't seen him and I don't see him right now, I'm filled with a faith that causes me to rejoice, that causes me to stand up, that causes me to declare God is still good, God is still great. Even if I don't think what's happening was in the brochure. Thank you, Lord. We worship you this morning, God. Let's stand to our feet. Let's, let's worship God. If, you, if you'd like prayer, feel free to come forward. Feel free to turn to somebody next to you and, and offer to pray for them. That's completely fine. Feel free to have a tea and coffee, whatever it is that you want to do. But listen, if the Holy Spirit's speaking to you, please don't walk away without responding to what He's saying to you. That's how we grow. That's how change happens. We respond to what the Holy Spirit is saying and doing in our lives. Amen.